folks, thanks for coming along tonight. We're renewing, re resuming some of our um, live functions, but there are some people on Zoom as well that they're alive, but they're not, they're not with us, but they're certainly alive. So welcome to them as well. Uh, Rob Hadler makes a welcome first appearance at the Sydney Institute, although he's been a friend of the Institute for many years. Now, this is on the occasion of the release of his most recent book, Mutineers, A True Story of Heroes and Villains. And tonight, Rob's going to talk for us about on the topic of um, murder, mutiny and political controversy. But last year, we couldn't do this here because of the pandemic, but Rob also put out Dark Secrets, Dark Secrets The True Story of Murder in the HMAS Australia. That, of course, is the Second World War, and what we're talking tonight is the aftermath of the First World War. Now, both of those books are available for sale. If you're on a Zoom, uh, they're also, we, we send them out postage free, $30 each. So, now I'll just introduce our speaker, he's well known to many of you. Um, Robert, Rob, Robert Hadler lives in Melbourne, he's a former award winning econ economics journalist who has worked in the Commonwealth Public Service as well. He's worked as a political advisor, as a lobbyist for industry groups, and in senior executive roles. And since 2015, he's been a director on government, corporate and not-for-profits not boards. His passion is writing about Australian history, which is why he's here today to talk on the topic of murder, mystery and political controversy. Robert, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today because it's... Uh, been locked up in Melbourne with COVID restrictions for most of last year. Uh, I, it was great to get out of Melbourne today and to fly to Sydney, catch the ghost train in from the airport uh, and, and actually do some business. Uh, meet people, shake hands. Uh, it's been a long time for people in Melbourne uh, not doing that. So uh, it's great to be here in this very familiar and, and quite frankly cosy audience. So thank you for having me. Um, a few uh, thank yous and some recognition before I begin. Um, I'd particularly like to uh, uh, thank Jared and Anne Henderson uh, for their support. Um, they established the Sydney Institute in 1989. Uh, I was in London as uh, the Australian's foreign correspondent at that stage, but when I came back to work in the corporate sector, uh, a few years later, I joined the Sydney Institute, so it's been almost 30 years since I've been following the work of Gerard uh, uh, and Nan, and I, th I think they've been a shining beacon of light in the culture of Sydney, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Obviously, thank you for coming along on a Tuesday evening, and for the guests on Zoom as well, so I'm pleased you're, you're here. Um, Two people who I have to acknowledge is uh, my agent, Margaret G, and my publisher, Michael Wilkinson. Um, they've really indulged me in my passion for Australian history, and if it wasn't for them, I couldn't be here tonight, so I'm very grateful to them. And two others, um, some naval historians uh, whose work and support enabled me to write about the substance of the issues in these books. So. David Stevens, uh, who wrote uh, a lot about World War I, and Rear Admiral James Goldrick, uh, who was a great mentor for the book uh, Dark Secrets. And finally, uh, and very dear to my heart tonight, um, the family and friends of some of the characters who enabled in these stories, who enabled me to write personally engaging books about their lives. Uh, so tonight we've got uh, Giles Yates, who's here, uh, a friend of Ron Gordon, uh, who was uh, involved in the uh, Dark Secrets, and Cheryl and Robert Langford, uh, who are uh, related to uh, Del Morton and Lenny uh, Rudd, who were the, uh, the prime characters in uh, the mutiny story. So I'm very pleased that you've been able to come and I'm extremely grateful for your personal contributions and your support in writing the story. So thank you very much. So mutiny, murder and political controversy. Um, the, the, this story tonight 
really starts with the mutiny in 1919 and ends with the murder in 1942. Uh, even though the books were written out of order, I think that's the logical way to present these stories because it charts at a high level the transition of Australia from a colony to a dependent dominion to an independent country over the first 50 years after Federation. The books also deal with some very, quite frankly, complex and serious issues. Military control, legal and constitutional change, and political intervention in military matters. But I didn't want to just write about those things. Quite frankly, if I'd done that, it would have ended up as an academic textbook writing on library shelves. I wanted to write for a wider range of people who are going to be more engaged in the personal stories of the, of the people that actually that drove the events. So that's how I've tried to write these stories. They're human interest stories with very serious uh, themes and issues uh, involved in them. And I've tried to write it with as much academic rigour as possible. If you turn to the, uh, the end notes, I think Mutineers has over 740 uh, references. So I take great pride in, as Jared said before, talking about facts, but using the facts in a very engaging way. You may not be able to see these slides in, if, in, in the room or, or on Zoom, but if you can't, don't worry about it too much because they're all in the books. So I encourage you to buy the books and you'll be able to see them. But instead of just having a simple talking head up here, and I've got a great head for radio, uh, so instead of talking, using a talking head, I'm going to use these slides to try and bring the story to life. Um, my latest book, Mutineers, really charts the fortunes and misfortunes of these five working class men. Uh, two, three from Sydney, uh, two from Melbourne, uh, who really got enchanted in, in, in the, uh, the Royal Australian Navy. They saw it as a way of an escape from their working class, humble working class upbringing, and an opportunity to travel the world and fight the Germans. Uh, there are two brothers uh, on your far left. Uh, there's Del Morton Rudd and his younger brother Lenny Rudd. They lived in Camp Campsie in Western Sydney. Uh, their good friend Ken Peterson uh, on, their, on the right, very handsome young man, grew up in Young in central New South Wales but shifted to Canterbury and lived on the Crooks River not far from the, the Rudds. Uh, and then you had the right of a shady looking Bill McIntosh uh, who grew up in Coburg uh, and the swarthy Peter Thompson whose father uh, was, came from the Verde Islands uh, which is a Portuguese um, settlement uh, off West Africa but he was often mistaken for having indigenous uh, Australian or, or uh, Kiwi Maori background and, and you'll see I've written about that in my book. So these five young guys uh, all came to together uh, on the, uh, in the engine room and the decks of uh, uh, the Royal Australian Navy. They were young, they were brave, but they were naive about what they were getting into. And what were they getting into? Well, Australia uh, as a young country uh, had its first fleet, all of it built in Great Britain, nothing, none of it built here, um, and it comprised of just nine ships. There was the Battle Cruiser Australia, which was the biggest and deadliest warship in the Southern Hemisphere at that time. There were two light cruisers, the Melbourne and the Sydney, and there were six river class torpedo destroyers. Um, this was uh, a sunny Saturday in uh, Sydney uh, in October 19th, late October 1913, when the new fleet arrived. 300,000 Sydney siders lined the shores of uh, Sydney Harbour uh, to watch the, the new fleet arrive. 
Um, it was small compared to the great white fleet from the US Navy that visited Australia in 1908. But all the newspapers, all the politicians and a lot of the general public saw it as the first tangible sign of nationhood. Uh, and uh, HMAS Australia was the flagship uh, of the Australian Navy. However, while it was a, a tangible sign and it looked impressive, the reality is that the Australian fleet was too small uh, to act in an independent way. And it relied heavily on the Royal Navy for its officer corps, uh, its petty officers and logistic support. Um, as a, as a, when the war broke out in August 1914, because it was, couldn't act independently, the Australian government transferred control of the Royal Australian Navy to the Admiralty. Um, this may have seemed sensible at the start, uh, but it had deep and dire consequences and unintended consequences for the sailors who breached uh, British military discipline. The Admiralty, or once the Admiralty got control of the Royal Australian Navy, it could and did order our ships to sail the world without consultation with the Australian government. And it could and did charge Australian sailors, no matter where they were, were in the world, under King's regulations for breaches of, Australia, uh, of naval discipline. They weren't under Australian law for the duration of the war. That was the unintended consequence. I don't think the government understood what it was doing when it did that. As I said, fate brought our five uh, young teenagers together on Australia towards the end of the war. They all served on different ships, but they all came together at the end. Unfortunately, Australia was an un the Australia was an unlucky ship, and for our five uh, friends at least, it was an unhappy ship. Why do I say that? Well, it served for six months in the Pacific before the Admiralty took it off to the North Sea. And Australian uh, sailors who were used to Australian conditions in the Pacific suddenly thrust into winter in 1915 in the North Sea, based at Scapa Flow, north of Scotland. It was a rude shock. Many of them came down with uh, pneumonia. Uh, there was a, a disease uh, uh, outbreak of mumps. Um, and the Admiralty was forced to put uh, fleet surgeons onto the Australia to make sure that the sailors actually survived uh, the first winter in the north. It also collided the Australia twice uh, with Royal Navy ships, uh, which took it out of the war at crucial periods of the war. And in fact, they missed the Battle of Jutland as a result of the first collision with HMS New Zealand. Um, this destroyed crew morale. They joined up to fight the Germans and they missed it. And they never recovered, the morale never recovered because of that. So they had sickness and damaged morale. The, ship, the, the battle cruiser only fired its guns twice in anger during the whole war. The first was in early 1915 when it sank a German auxiliary in the South Atlantic and the second time was in December 1917 uh, when they, they fired on a suspected German submarine. They didn't even know whether there was one there. Um, so boredom and frustration, sickness and anger were building up tension on the battle cruiser right through the latter stages of the war. It got so bad that one of our Five, Bill McIntosh deserted and he was intent on uh, joining the Australian infantry forces in France to fight under General Monash in the last uh, push of the war in 1918. But he got apprehended by the Metropolitan Police in London and sent back to the Australia. But that was indicative of how frustrated the sailors on the Australia were. They lost their zeal and jaundice set in. There were only two highlights for the five, and in truth it was only highlights for one of the five. Dalmorton Rudd managed to volunteer 
for a Royal British Navy raid uh, on the German port of a submarine base at Zeebrugge in Belgium in April 1918. Um, in truth, it was a failed raid. They sunk some block ships in the channel for the submarine base, but the Germans were able to move those block ships pretty easily. But the British paid a heavy price for it. They lost over 250 sailors and Royal Marines in the raid. Uh, but the British were so determined that they want to turn it into a, a propaganda victory that they awarded 11 VCs and multiple Distinguished Service Medals. Now, Del Morton Rudd uh, was uh, placed on the ballot for a VC for his actions on uh, the Ocean Mole, the, the breakwater uh, at Sabrug. He didn't get it because the numbers in the ballot were heavily weighted in favour of the Royal Navy and the, and the Royal Marines. But he was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. And um, this was a highlight for him. Uh, not so much of what he did, although it was great fun for him, uh, but it gave him great bragging rights uh, with his mates on the ship. And it led to a promotion. Uh, and this was a highlight of his war career. The other highlight for Del Morton Rudd was that he met his first wife in England, uh, Isabel Whit Whitley. She was a barmaid uh, in a northern England city and um, unbeknownst to Del Morton Rudd, she was pregnant to him. And when he saw her immediately after the war, she was six months pregnant, so it was quite a shock. Um, but he immediately pledged that he would marry her and he did so in January 1919, after the war. And he was determined to take her and the new baby back to Australia. Unfortunately, tragedy struck in March 1919 with the outbreak of the Spanish flu. Uh, Isabel died in childbirth. She was already very weak uh, from the Spanish flu and the complications of childbirth. So she passed away and Del Morton was not in a position to look after the baby, also called Isabel, but Isabel Amelia. And she was handed to um, Isabel's uh, extended family uh, in Britain to look after. Uh, Del Morton wouldn't know it then, but unfortunately the baby would only live uh, another few months and it too would also die of the Spanish flu. So this was great tragedy. Uh, for Del Morton Rudd. He went into a period of heavy drinking. He was, remo he was uh, remorse um, and he was increasingly resentful of discipline. So this was a very difficult time for Del Morton and his friends on, on Australia. Uh, and when the war ended uh, and uh, Australia sailed back to, uh, to its homeland, in May 1919, there were increasing signs of tension on the warship. Uh, it was quite clear that um, there was restfulness, they, they were rest, restful, and they did not want to obey Royal Navy re, uh, discipline any longer. The visit to Fremantle, their first home port uh, visit in Australia in four and a half years, was full of, it was only four days and the first three days were full of official visits. Out of generosity, the captain granted them overnight leave uh, in Fremantle. This was a tragic mistake because what they did um, was to go into all the pubs in Fremantle and mix with the Fremantle Lumpers Union members who were in town for a colonial, coronial inquiry into the, the death of one of their members over strike breaking and, and police riots, or riots with police, uh, earlier that year. And the captain right, writes in his memoirs, the sailors came back onto the battle cruiser full of the spirit of Bolshevism. And it was uh, unusual for sailors to be granted leave the night before the ship sailed. So this was a fatal flaw that actually allowed the mutiny to happen the next morning, Sunday morning, because what happened very briefly is that they came back on board, uh, many 
with deep hangovers, many drunk. Uh, still, they demanded, they organised 80 to 100 of, of the crew on the quarter deck to demand the ship stay in port a day longer. When the captain refused that, the five ringleaders of the mutiny went down into the stokehold and convinced 25 of the stokers to leave the stokehold so the ship couldn't sail. That was the moment the mutiny occurred in the eyes of the Royal Navy officers who led the ship. Now, Captain Cumberledge, who'd experienced um, ill discipline before, would have normally let these guys sleep off their hangovers and when they got to Sydney, he would have dismiss, dismissed them from the service because they'd reached the end of their careers. However, the Commodore of the Australian fleet, Dumbresk, was so upset about what had happened that he ordered an inquiry and for the five ringleaders to be court-martialed. <coughs> the court-martial in Sydney only lasted a few hours. The, the five mutineers had been convinced by Dal Morton Rudd's father to own up, cop the sentence and move on. So that it was not contested. Cumbledge also supported, gave a personal referee's uh, support for Patterson and Thompson. But the court-martial panel, once they'd found the sailors guilty, then had no choice but, under British naval law and King's regulations, to sentence them to several years' hard labour in Australian jails. And they were marched off to Goulburn. The ALP in Canberra, uh, sorry, this was in Melbourne at this stage, um, seized on what they called these savage sentences because it happened immediately after the war and there was no war imperative to, uh, to confirm naval discipline, to try and embarrass the nationalist government in the lead up to the federal election in December 1919. The two leaders, Billy Hughes and Joseph Cook, were still in Paris negotiating for Australia, the Paris Peace Accord. Bill Watt and Alec Poynton were the acting Prime Minister and the acting Minister for the Navy, and quite frankly, they were rabbits caught in the headlights by the Labor Party on this issue. All they wanted to do was defend naval discipline, and they completely missed the popular political mood of Australia at the time. When Billy Hughes came back to Australia with Joseph Cook in August 1919, they decided they had to get this issue fixed before the election. Um, they immediately lob lobbied the Admiralty uh, to commute the sentences. The Admiralty refused because they didn't want to undermine naval discipline in the fleet. Uh, they ended up proposing that there would be a phased release of the prisoners, but this was not enough for Hughes because the phased release wouldn't kill this off as a political issue before the election. So he went over the heads of the Admiralty and went to Whitehall. They saw the political imperative and the Colonial Secretary, Viscount Milner, agreed to release the prisoners in December. Killed it off as a political issue. However, the Royal Navy leaders of the Australian Navy in Australia were so incensed at political interference in military discipline that they threatened to resign. That was Commodore Dumaresk and the Chief of the Australian Naval Staff, Percy Grant. It took months of behind the scenes negotiations by Joseph Cook uh, and various concessions to stop these two naval leaders from resigning and undermining the growth of the Australian Navy for decades to come. However, once the immediate problem was solved, they didn't face into the underlying issues of control of the Australian Navy during the war. And this would come back to haunt them again 20 years later. So my other book, Dark Secrets, continues the story. But it happens after the interwar period when uh, the British government, follow lobbying from Canada and South Africa, agreed to the Balfour Declaration in 1926, 
which said that there would be that the Dominion should be given independent and equal legal status with Great Britain. Unfortunately, several Australian governments failed to adopt that before the Second World War. And once again, when war broke out, what did they do? The Australian government, the same as what had happened in World War I, they ceded operational control of the Australian Navy to the Admiralty with the same legal and military implications. They'd forgotten the lessons from the mutiny. Once again, it might have seemed sensible at first in the first few years of the war when Australia was fighting Germany, Italy and the Vichy Fr French in West Africa. But it didn't make any sense at all when the Australia was recalled uh, to the Pacific to operate with a US fleet against the Japanese. Once again, three more young men were brought together by fate in the engine room of this second HMAS Australia, the new flagship of the Australian fleet during World War II. It served in the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic in the first few years of the war before it was recalled to the Pacific. It was a lucky ship. It missed being sunk several times uh, in the Atlantic. It missed collisions that the first HMAS Australia didn't. Uh, and it was generally a happy ship. But there was a very dark secret on HMAS Australia. Um, Jack Riley, a young boy who joined the RAN at the age of 16, grew up in Belle Reve, uh, in Hobart, um, served for two and a half years uh, in the boiler room of the Australia. He came home uh, on leave, on sick leave, in, De in December 41, um, and unfortunately his mother could tell that he didn't want to go back on board. But Jack Riley never said why. We now know why. Uh, and what no one knew at the time was that he was confronted by um, homosexual activity in the engine room of the, the flagship or, or claims of homosexuality in the flagship. And it allegedly, eventually it led to a confrontation on the deck of HMAS Australia between Jack Riley and two other stokers. And he was mortally wounded in that confrontation and he died the next day and was buried at sea the following day in the Coral Sea. His family were devastated when they were told by simple telegram of his death. They initially thought he'd, been, he'd died a war hero as a casualty of action. They were devastated to learn later on when the captain wrote a personal letter that he'd been murdered by his fellow shipmates. They never spoke about it again for the rest of their lives. Jack became a photo on the wall that was lost to posterity. Captain Far Farncombe, uh, the commander of the Australia, initially uh, was shocked by what had happened, ordered an inquiry. His executive officer, Black Jack Armstrong, I love that nickname, uh, sent a secret report to Farncombe that based on third degree interrogations of the stokers in the engine room, that concluded that Riley had tried to blackmail two other stokers, Ron Gordon and Ted Elias, over their alleged homosexual activity. It also concluded uh, that Gordon and uh, Elias had murdered Riley. They were immediately uh, sentenced uh, to a court-martial. Um, the Navy decided that it didn't want to raise the motive because it would damage morale on the ship and it would potentially give the Japanese uh, dangerous propaganda to use against Australia in the dark days of the war. Therefore, they decided to use only circumstantial evidence at the, at the um, court-martial. Trevor Rapke became the prisoner's friend or the defence attorney. Um, he was a pre-war Melbourne lawyer. Uh, 
uh, and did a pretty good job, uh, given that he was up against a, a, a court-martial panel and a captain of superior rank. The court-martial decided that um, the two men were guilty, despite the fact that there were no direct eyewitness accounts, there was no murder weapon, had obviously been thrown overboard, and there was no motive. And Rapke was also upset that Captain Farncombe had given his personal view at the trial that the two were guilty. He argued that the captain giving a personal view to a panel of more junior officers adversely influenced the verdict. As you can see here, you've got Ron Gordon on the left, Ted Elias on the right. This is immediately after they were uh, eventually let out of prison, and I'll come back to that. But they were sentenced to hang uh, from the yard arm by the court martial panel. The, the sentence was automatic under King's regulations. Um, under Australian law, it would have been life imprisonment. But because they were operating under the operational control of the Royal Navy, the Admiralty's um, sentences applied. The new Labor government, which had only been in power for six months, was shocked when it heard about this. It was opposed to capital punishment. It wanted to intervene, but it couldn't. Norman Macon, the Navy minister, um, start, was able to stay the death sentence, but not to head it off. But it gave them enough time for civil rights leaders and for the Australian government to try to lobby uh, and try legal tactics. Two civil rights lawyers, Frank Lewitt and David Hall, David Hall was a former Attorney General in New South Wales, launched an historic habeas corpus case uh, in the High Court in uh, May 1942. The High Court didn't sit long, but it took two months to make up its mind. And the five High Court judges all agreed that the sentences were valid because of the executive order signed by the Governor-General on the recommendation of the Australian Government to hand control to the Admiralty. So the sentences were upheld. This forced the Australian Government into a protracted lobbying campaign with the Admiralty and Whitehall to save the lives of the two sailors. As in World War I, the lobbying of, of the Admiralty was initially rebuffed. They, didn't, they had Canadians, Indians, South Africans all serving in the Royal Navy and they didn't want to create a dangerous precedent by giving an exception for two Australian stokers. However, Viscount Cranbourne, uh, seen here on the right, who was the Secretary of State for the Colonies, was very alert to keeping the Dominions together during the war. And he told Churchill and the King, George VI, of the need to acquiesce to the Australian um, requests. As a result, King George VI agreed to grant clemency and commute uh, the death sentence to life imprisonment. This clearly saved their lives, but now Gordon and Elias were facing a life locked up in Goulburn Jail. And their friends and the civil rights lawyers were not about to let that go. And they started a decade-long campaign to have them released from jail. And eventually they were released, as you saw in that photo of Ted Elias's wedding in 1950. However, what's more important for this story uh, is that Bert Evatt, the Attorney General and External Affairs Minister in the Labor government in the, during the war, was so annoyed about the lack of control over the Royal Australian Navy as a result of this incident that he decided to adopt the Statute of Westminster. And this was right in the middle of the war, October 42. It was a huge gamble because he didn't have the numbers in the Senate. But dis despite some grandstanding by Menzies and Billy Hughes, who were still in the Parliament at that stage, the opposition decided to vote 
in favour of adoption of the Statute of Westminster. This occurred only after a secret briefing in the Senate chamber by, Hugh, uh, by Bert Evan and legal advisers from the AG's department about what had happened on the Australia and why it was necessary to intervene. So the adoption of this act, which made Australia legally independent from Great Britain for the first time in October 42, was directly triggered by the murder on the Australia. So what are my conclusions? Look, there's a high level of secrecy in, in Australia's laws of engagement with our military allies. We quite frankly don't know who and when our soldiers are serving uh, when they're overseas. And it's unclear what might happen in the future under the new Quad Alliance if, God forbid, there's a war with China. Australian soldiers, sailors and airmen could end up serving again with US forces. After all, all our equipment is interoperable with the US. It, it's not far-fetched. So I think it's extremely important that the lesson from these two episodes is that there are clear and unambiguous rules of engagement to protect Australian servicemen if they're serving with our allies. The second thing is that Political intervention in military matters continues today. And the lesson from these two incidents is that the politicians need to be very careful about doing that. Morrison intervened in uh, the award of a posthumous VC to Teddy Sheehan. And Peter Dutton intervened to overrule the Defence Department in the retention of service medals to our, to our uh, secret service staff and secret forces in Afghanistan. These were popular political decisions driven by community sentiment. Now, no military leaders have resigned or threatened to resign that we know of as a result of these political interventions. But our political leaders must be cognizant of the lessons of the past. And as the old saying goes, if you don't learn from the lessons of the past, you're condemned to repeat the mistakes. Thanks, Gerard. Many thanks, Robert. <laughs> so as I said, starting at the beginning, we've got copies for sale and we're selling online and postage free. Mutineers, the true story of the hero of heroes and villains from post-World War I and Robert Hadler's Dark Secret, the true story of murder in the HMAS Australia in the middle of World War II and the Pacific War. So now we come to questions and discussion. I think Anne and I are members of the Teddy Sheehan fan club here, so you've got to, you've got to be careful. A, a brave Tasmanian, I must say. Um, but can I just talk to you about justice? In the first, in the first instance, the mutiny, some Australian sailors get drunk don't want to go to sea, that's okay. And Billy Hughes makes a very strong stance, the former Labor leader who's now the Nationalist leader. But in the second case, um, and you make the point about what Bert Ebert did as Attorney General, but this was a pretty brutal murder, wasn't it? I mean, there was a young man who was brutally murdered on a ship and there didn't seem to be a lot of sympathy for the victim in this instance. Tell us about the victim. I think they're, they're very fair points, uh, Gerard. Um, and I had a great deal of sympathy for the victim. Um, it took a long while to track down uh, the, the descendants of Jack Riley. Uh, and they're still living uh, with the grief of what happened in 1942. Uh, his descendants are living both here in Sydney uh, and in Belle Reve uh, in Hobart. And they didn't know the full story of what had happened until I wrote the book. Um, and Giles Yates is here tonight, a, a friend of Ron Gordon, and it was very confronting for Giles to go through the journey that I went through in the book. Um, and both Ron Gordon and Ted Elias were adamant that they hadn't murdered 
uh, Jack Ryle. But I have ended up concluding that they did commit the murder on the basis of not only the court martial, the, the highly circumstantial evidence, but Evett commissioned uh, a separate judicial inquiry in 1944 by a Supreme Court Justice in New South Wales, Alan Maxwell. And he spent a week uh, going through all the evidence independently with a legal eye. The Australia was called back from the Pacific so he could go on board both at night and day and look at the, mur the murder scene. He, de he determined there was no doubt that Ron Gordon and Ted Elias had committed the murder. I think the only aspect that remains in question was the rumour in the Armstrong report that this was over blackmail, over homosexual activity. There's no documented evidence to prove that. So I think there's no doubt the murder occurred. I think from my position there's no doubt that Gordon and Elias committed it. But I also think they did the time and they paid for the crime. And I think afterwards, you read what happened to them in the book, but they went on to live long and very happy lives. But they did what, 10 years and 8 years or something? I did like uh, eight, years. 8 years. 8 years. Right, so uh, where do we go? Down the back there, just hang on. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm just interested in... Um, Thanks for the very interesting talk, by the way. Just interested in why um, British military discipline applied to sailors in the Australian Navy, but not, to my knowledge, Australian soldiers who I don't think faced the death penalty for desertion, um, whereas British soldiers did. So why the difference between sailors and, and, and soldiers? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question, Stuart. And, and it's, it, it's a specific case because the Australian government and the Governor-General signed an executive order handing over control of the Australian Royal Australian Navy to the Admiralty. That didn't occur, occur in, in, in the case of uh, the Army, uh, nor our, our airmen who fought with the uh, Royal um, Air Force during the war. So that, that was the technical reason. So there was a, uh, a legal transfer of power under our constitution at that time uh, to the British that we could not, as a dominion, overrule until the Statute of Westminster was passed. Uh, there's a question here. So, um, Robert, um, it, do you want to make any comment about uh, the Break and Morant, the Break and Morant um, trial and, and uh, execution and uh, any repercussions that that, that had that uh, influenced the, the two stories that you've told? Yeah, look, uh, thanks, Giles. Uh, from my perspective, a lot of Australians know of the Breaker Morant story and the alleged miscarriage of justice. Uh, this is one of the great Australian myths. In fact, Breaker Morant was not Australian, he was British. Um, and while he did serve with uh, some Australian forces at the time. Um, when he was convicted uh, uh, at the court-martial, he was actually serving with a British irregular force. Uh, so this was a British soldier serving with a British force that was shot for uh, execution of prisoners. So quite frankly, I don't have much support for Breaker Moran. But it was the popular myth that grew out of the book that was written some years after the event uh, uh, by one of the officers who escaped sanction, uh, scapegoats of the empire, uh, that fed into popular community folklore that underpinned the court of common justice that urged the sailors to be released from jail. Uh, that continued the campaign to stop Australian sailors convicted of murder from capital punishment. So even though I think it was fallacious, it had a deep-seated impact on uh, local community and political views about how sailors should be treated. Yeah, 
John, the back there, Matthew, um, and then Ian. Rob, uh, this is your second book on naval history, and uh, I was just wondering what stimulated your interest in this fairly specialised field. And I could just ask another question as well. With um, is it widely known in historical circles that the adoption of the Statue of Westminster was stimulated by the uh, people? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Great to see you here. Uh, look, I, my dad served on uh, in the Navy during World War II, so I've got a soft spot for the Navy. Um, he served on the Hobart, which was um, right at the end of the war, and he was involved. Uh, he was on the Hobart when uh, uh, the Hobart went to uh, Japan for the signing of the Peace Treaty. So that's always stayed with me, and I've had a soft spot for the Navy, plus an. Uh, enduring interest in Australian history after decades uh, working in Canberra. Um, so that's why I've written about naval history and how it applies to the wider context of our constitutional change in Australian politics. Um, I think the two books were, were a natural bookend. The two, the two the stories were a natural bookend, as I said at the start of my presentation. Um, about Australia's slow and painful change from a colony to an independent country. So I think <laughs> the mutiny and the murder just naturally fitted together. I think I've probably finished with Australian naval history, although um, I certainly don't want to be book, uh, slotted into that uh, niche uh, part of Australian history. And I've got a few ideas which I'll talk to various uh, members in the audience tonight about for, for future stories. Uh, and just, sorry, just to answer your uh, question about the Statute of Westminster, there's no doubt that in the specialised field of, of fields of law and constitutional reform that people know about the Statute of Westminster, uh, certainly not outside of that, but no one really knows about what was the trigger for the adoption of the Statute. So that's what drove me initially to write the book, uh, Dark Secrets. But what compelled me to finish it was the personal stories of the Riley family and Ron Gordon and Ted Elias. Ian. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, fascinating stories. When the Australian government at the time, at the beginning of the 1915, I think it was, ceded control of the of the Australian Navy to, to the Admiralty. Was there no time frame put on that? In, in, I'm thinking particularly, you know, why come the end of the First World War was control not returned back to the Australian government? So why in 1919, when HMAS, HMAS Australia returned to Perth in 1919, was it still under Royal Navy control? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Ian, and one that's never been properly answered, other than uh, the executive order says for the duration of the war uh, or whatever's necessary. And the whatever's necessary is that it actually took six months for to recall all the Australian troops and ships from Europe back to Australia. So the handover actually back to Australian control didn't occur till 9 August 1919. So even though they were in Fremantle, an Australian ship with Australian sailors, on 1 June 19, they were still under the King's regulations. And, this, and that occurred even though a lot of those sailors, including Del Morton Rudd, had reached the end of their five-year service agreements. Those five-year service agreements ran out in October 1918. So they were forced to stay on the ship under British control until they got back home. Yeah, Rob, yeah, great speech. Um, just, am I, am I misinterpreting you, but are you critical of the political intervention in both those cases? <sighs> I understand political intervention and I understand what's driving it. It's the political empower, imperative of staying in power, heading off nasty uh, political issues or pandering to popular opinion. So I understand it, 
I don't condone it, and I certainly recognise uh, the risks associated with it. And I think we've been lucky in recent years that uh, our senior leaders in the armed forces haven't objected to what's been happening. I ask you about the statute of Westminster. Ask you about the statute of Westminster. It was 1931, and it took did it 11 years for the Australian federal government to decide to adopt it. Why was it such a long time for that reservation to be adopted? And when it was adopted, that would be in Curtin's day, did it have any correlation with the arrival of the American influence in Australian foreign affairs? Uh, great questions, thank you. Um, uh, in, my, in my book, I spend about a chapter going through the transition uh, from the Balfour Declaration uh, to the statute of adoption of the statute in 31 in uh, Westminster, um, and why it wasn't adopted in Australia. And to put it bluntly, Menzies tabled the, Legis the Adoption Act twice in the 30s, but let it to rot on the, on the table both times because he couldn't convince the Nationalist Party to adopt the legislation. They didn't want to, particularly in the lead up to the Second World War, cut the apron strings with Great Britain. Now, ironically, Great Britain was never able to live up to its promises to defend Australia. And that leads to the second point it did ha happen at the same time as the strategic pivot to the United States. With the fall of Singapore and the inability uh, of the Royal Navy to leave the Mediterranean and come to our aid uh, in the Pacific, our natural ally was the US. So it did happen at that strategic pivot. Did it drive the adoption of the statute? I don't think so. I don't think the strategic pivot to the US was a key driver. I think the murder and the lack of Australian control over our own sailors was the primary driver. Um, Rob, uh, back to the basic thing. The, the murder um, in the Second World War, did you, is, is it clear what the dispute between the men was about? I mean, you mentioned homosexuality and all that, but was it gay bashing or a fight between gays? I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, there's not enough evidence uh, in the National Archives and the people who really know what happened have passed away. Uh, it's all supposition based on the secret Armstrong memo, which is in the National Archives, that was based on, as he wrote, third degree interrogation of the Stokers. And I think we need to be very careful about rumour, particularly after the event, being applied to what actually happened. But there's no doubt that there was a fight between the three sailors. The supposition is that, as I said, Riley was trying to blackmail Gordon and Elias, so he wasn't an angel either. Um, but it's all supposition. And, I, and when you reflect on it, that was a fair enough decision not to use that evidence or in the court martial. Okay. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Look, just to refresh me, wasn't there a, a deathbed con confession in the sick bay? Uh, uh, wasn't there a deathbed confession or, or sorry, a remark from, from as, as he was dying? Yes, when he was exactly right, Piers. When he was taken uh, down, who's he? Oh, the Jack Riley. Sorry. Oh, Jack Riley. Right. So when Jack Riley was mortally stabbed on the deck uh, by Gordon and Elias, he was taken down to the sick bay. He was stabbed fourteen times in the abdomen, uh, the legs, and the arms. It was a very brutal stabbing, um, as Jared referred to before. Um, 
many of the stab wounds went into his internal organs and were cuts to the bone. So he was in a lot of pain. He was, heavily, he was also given huge doses of morphine to stop the pain. So there's a question of the veracity of any evidence given in those circumstances. But he did give a deathbed claim to the surgeon that Gordon had attacked him. Gordon. Gordon. And in later life, Gordon told some friends that he was sticking up for his little mate, Ted Lyles. So if we put those things together, all we can conclude is that Gordon was the primary attacker defending Elias for some reason against Riley. But we will never know with certainty what the primary motive was. We're getting near the end, so I think we've got to be very brief in final question. So I, I wonder, Robert, whether you have, um, whether when you spoke to Jeremy Rapke or any other legal experts, whether you asked them to review the transcript of the court martial and give an opinion on whether they thought it was a safe verdict. Uh, because when we look at it from the 21st century, I think you can see it through a lens of absolute rampant homophobia that simply, even though the, the conviction was reviewed, uh, more than once, uh, I don't think they would have had that uh, awareness of homophobia as a, a prejudicial culture. Um, Thanks, Charles. There's, there's no doubt that Farncombe and some of the officers on board the Australia knew of the homosexual allegations, even though it wasn't raised in the uh, court martial. Um, however, the motive was never used in the court of law, in the in the court in the in the court martial. So, I'm not sure that homophobia applied in the court martial. The other important fact I think to remember is that Alan Maxwell was not aware of those allegations uh, when he completed his independent judicial review in 1944 that led to the reduction in the jail sentences. So he gave it a very good legal review based on the facts and that what was highly circumstantial evidence without any prejudicial <coughs> flavour of homophobia. So I think the Maxwell inquiry is the bedrock that should be used to, to look at this issue. Finally, um Tell us a little bit about Billy Hughes, because he's born in Wales and he comes out here as uh, essentially a waterside worker and within s some decades he's standing up to, um, as the leader of the Nationalist Party, the Conservative Party, he's standing up to high figures in the Admiralty. He was obviously a pretty tough bloke to do that. And finally, uh, you've done two volumes, Any, anything else in mind? Thanks, Jared. Um, Billy Hughes is a personal favourite of mine because um, I think he's one, probably one of the most colourful characters in Australian political history. Um, he is the longest serving federal MP still. Uh, he served right from before the First World War until well after the Second World War. Um, and he went through that whole period of transition in the Australian Constitution. As you say, Jared, he, um, he stood up for Australia's rights at the Paris Peace Conference. He stood up to the Admiralty. He stood up for Australian soldiers, uh, both in uh, the First World War and the Second World War. I don't think he gets due credit for his contribution to Australia, quite frankly, because he left the Labor Party uh, in the middle of the war after the failed uh, conscription referendums. And I think the black leg of left-wing history 
quite frankly, has been applied to Billy Hughes. Um, but he was a very divisive character in Australian politics. Mm. Is the only Prime Minister to lose two referenda? <laughs> Here we go. Many thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Well done. Well, there was an interjection that Billy Hughes lost two referenda, but he did win three elections. So <laughs> I think he's in front. Uh, Rob, thanks very much for a fascinating talk about not simply about military history, but also about individuals who served in, in the naval service. It's a person, per, I think the books are so strong because they do talk about people and how they faced up to the crises they faced, had to face as, as well as to what goes on in the legal sphere and the military sphere. So as I said, we've got copies of Mutineers, we've got copies of Dark Secrets. Um, Rob didn't answer my final question. I think he's got something up his sleeve about another book. <laughs> but if there is another book, if there is Volume 3, you're very welcome to come here and talk about it because we've had a great night tonight. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Okay. Thank you, folks. <laughs>